Welcome to 12 Things We Must Do to Fight Sin. Now, this was a two-part series uh, that we did during Sunday School at Temple of Cristiano Nisi and uh, the English Sunday School service. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take both of these and I'm going to put them into one video. So let's go ahead and get started with 1 Peter verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now let's go on to Titus chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, we just talked about this uh, on Thursday night recently. Again, Temple of Cristiano Nisi, 7 p.m., English midweek service. And uh, we, we talked about how the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Now, here we talk about how. This is a study every Christian needs, folks, and this is a study every Christian should want. If you want to please God, if you want to walk in the Spirit, if you want to know the ways of God, if you want to fight sin, this is the study for you. And first, point number one. We need to have an active, vibrant prayer life. Matthew 6, 13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, Jesus wasn't saying that God leads into temptation. So please, Lord, stop leading us into temptation. That's not the prayer. In early modern English, the meaning was lead us away from temptation. When we enter into temptation, we need to pray to be led in the other direction. As a matter of fact, you should pray to be led in the other direction before temptation ever hits you. And folks, God's will is our sanctification, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God. Catch that. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Keep that in mind as we move on. Okay? Now let's move on to 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If we ask anything according to his will. Well, we just saw that the will of God is our sanctification. He told us. So if we ask according to his will, we're asking God, give me power to be holy. Give me the power to, to do what I need to do to walk in your ways. Then yes, that is his will. So you know he's going to do it. And folks, prayer. Prayer is how we build our faith. Jude 20. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Listen, you ever been vacuuming and you yank the plug from the wall? You just, you just be bopping along, listening to something, and you're just singing along, and suddenly, uh-oh, the vacuum stops working because you, 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 you pulled it out of its power source. You disconnected it from its source of power. Your source of power, folks, is the Lord. Hello, somebody. If you want to fight sin, you have to continue in prayer. Luke 18, 1 says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. You cannot fight flesh with flesh, folks. You cannot fight flesh with human will. You cannot fight sin with the very thing that sin is coming out of. You must stay plugged in to the Holy Spirit through prayer. Now, point number two, we must understand that we are in ultimate control. Folks, we have control over our flesh. Paul said this or I'm going to correct myself and say the Holy Spirit said this through Paul in 1 Corinthians 9.27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Folks, the Greek here indicates that Paul is putting the flesh under his feet. He is punishing the flesh. This isn't the same as those who would walk down the street whipping themselves, but the connotation is that you become your body's drill sergeant. You are in control of your body. It is under your heel, not the other way around. Folks, the flesh or the devil doesn't make you do anything. We're not talking about that old Yosemite Sam 
cartoon where, where he's like, oh, the devil made me do it. No, the devil tempted you, but you made the final decision. Listen, Romans 6, 18 says this, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You've been made free from sin. That means it doesn't have control over you anymore. You have made, you've been made free. Now, sin will mess with your head. Sin will try to convince you that you don't have control. But the fact of the matter is you have ultimate control over sin. You make the ultimate decision. You might think you got a gun to your head. The sin is sin is a manipulator. And your, your flesh is a manipulator. And they're going to try to convince you that, hey, you know what? This is really, really hard to stand up under. And this is really difficult to resist. But you know what? It doesn't matter. You may feel like you got a gun to your head, but you don't. Listen, you need to have what psychologists call an internal locus of control. It is a knowledge that you are the one that makes the final decision on whether or not you give in to sin or whether you stand against it. Folks, sin no longer commands you. Romans 6, 14, sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Being under grace means sin does not have dominion over you. What does that mean? That means you don't have to obey it anymore. Look at this. Romans 6, 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. You have been made free. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. You are free from sin. You have the ultimate control. Now, while we have the ultimate say-so, we do not get our power from ourselves. Hello, somebody. We look at Romans 8.13. It says, if ye through the Spirit, I'm going to stop there. If ye through the Spirit, through the Spirit, through the Spirit, not of ourselves, through the Spirit. Corinthians 3 5 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. The power comes from the Lord. Again, you need to stay plugged into the source, but you also need to understand that because of that power, you are the one with the ultimate control. But guess what? Psalm 54 4 says, God is your helper. Folks, we cannot fight flesh with the flesh it is impossible <laughs> it's like it's like trying to fight a country with, with its with its own army the army starts fighting against each other <laughs> now there is such a thing as friendly fire but that's always an accident it's not on purpose all right so let's look at this you you can't fight flesh with flesh second corinthians 10 3 for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh folks come on now Okay, the bottom line here, you are given power, but is not of the flesh. You have been given power over sin because of the Holy Spirit. But the bottom line here is that you have the power. Point number three, we need to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Did you catch that? Walk in the Spirit. Here's your cause. Ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's your effect. Listen, this is what it means to be full of the Spirit, okay? It isn't about speaking in tongues. It isn't about sign gifts. It isn't about healings. It's about bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 9 says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. You cannot be good without the Holy Spirit, first of all. Second of all, you have been, your heart is believed under righteousness. And you believe the truth because you're saved. Okay, you receive a love of the truth when you're saved. Okay, so all of that, it, that's the fruit of the Spirit, folks. Walking the Spirit leads to bearing this fruit. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. Okay, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. 
on a walk in the spirit, folks, is to let you conduct your daily lives be directed by the Holy Ghost. We submit to the Holy Spirit, folks. We submit to him. We submit our words. We submit our actions, even all of our thoughts and desires. The word says take everything captive, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So even our thoughts, our desires are supposed to be subject to the Holy Spirit. That's what happens when you bear the fruit. Well, pastor, I don't know about that. Well, didn't I just read you in Ephesians, uh, or excuse me, in Galatians 5 there, where it says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Come on now. To walk in the spirit, folks, is to, is, is to submit our sinful appetites, to submit our flesh to the spirit. And therefore, the, the flesh has no more dominion over us. And as we practice this, as we walk in the spirit more and more, the power of the flesh becomes less and less. Now let's move on to, uh, to Ephesians, rather. I seem to be flipping those in my head tonight, but that's okay. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. That ye put off concerning the former conversation. Let's stop right there for a second. The word conversation is a King James Bible word, uh, early modern English, that meant anything that you did that would communicate a message to someone else. That could not just words, but behavior as well. All right, so. So you can read this that ye put off concerning the former behavior, the old man. Well, let's go ahead and read what it says. Ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Look at that, the new man. That's when the Holy Spirit comes uh, comes to live inside you, and you become one with the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 2. Twain become one, and, we're, and Jesus presents us back to the Father. So that new man is a spiritual man. Okay, uh, we're, we're a new creature in Christ. All things are made new. We're given a new divine nature. And this new divine nature, folks, is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, since we have that on the inside, we're told here in Ephesians 4.24 to put it on the outside. Come on, somebody. We need to walk in that spirit that we have been given. What, how do we do that? You take the spirit that's been put on the inside of you and you bring it out and you live it. Point number four, because we walk in the spirit, we must mortify the deeds of the flesh. Romans 8.13 says, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Colossians 3, 5 agrees. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. It even tells you here what they are. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, inordinate affection, is a, it's excessive. Uh, you're hanging on somebody. It's okay to give somebody a hug, but you don't stand there and for 10 minutes and people are going to start thinking something's going on. And something better not be going on. You're a Christian now. You're supposed to, to walk in, this, in the spirit here. So the inordinate affection is excessive, way too much. Give somebody a side hug. Don't stand there with your arm around them. You got me. Concupiscence. That means strong sexual desire. Now the word mortify means to kill to make dead, to cut off. And folks, this gives understanding to what Jesus said in Matthew 18, 9, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Anybody ever know somebody that did this? Okay, there's a lot of Christians. Did anybody know any Christian who's cut out his eye and, and, and cut off his foot and his hand and no, we, do, we don't know that, okay? So, Jesus was not speaking of the physical cutting or physical plucking. He was speaking of a spiritual cutting off, mortification, folks. Spiritual mortification. Okay, the, again, those who have, been, who have had their roots removed from this world and have been rooted in Christ to where they abide have already begun the journey to putting to death the flesh. We just talked about that. Galatians 5.24, they that are Christ's are Christ's. They that are Christ's 
have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Then we have Luke 9.23, he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If you're going to follow Jesus, you have to die to yourself. Okay? That's what Jesus said, and that's what the scriptures repeatedly tell us. Point number five, we must think of ourselves as dead to sin. Romans 6, verses 11 through 14. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your, your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. That's your spiritual resurrection, folks. Ephesians 2, again, check it out. It's awesome. Okay, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Try scaring a corpse. Try startling a corpse. Try manipulating a corpse to do something that you want it to do. Offer some food to a corpse. Offer some drink to a corpse. Pick up a puppy dog and put it on a corpse's chest. Slap a corpse. No, don't slap a corpse. That's actually against the law. Don't do that. But you get the point. It's not going to do anything. Okay? That's the way we should be towards sin. No matter what sin tries to do, tries to manipulate us, tries to mess with us, tries to slap us. Come on, do do this. You're supposed to be dead to sin. You're supposed to consider yourself to be dead to sin. And point number six. We must resist Satan. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Listen, you have to resist the devil. You have to stand against the devil. The devil, folks, is your tempter. 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Listen, that devil takes your lusts from your flesh and uses them to draw you away. He is the tempter, folks. He wants you to sin. And he uses your own lust, your own desire to make you sin. Now, let me let me go ahead and go back and correct myself, not to make you sin, but to make you think you're being made to sin. Because remember, you have the power over sin. You have the power whether or not you do it or not. Just the devil messes with your head and makes you think, oh, this temptation is too hard to bear. Like you got a gun to your head. But no, 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 no. But it's your lust, folks. Your lust. So you need to cut it off from the source. Let's take a look at James 1.14. It says, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. See, here's the thing. You know why the devil couldn't get Jesus to sin? Okay, John 14, 30 says, and I'm sorry, I didn't put the scripture here. It says, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The thing is, he has something in all of us because we got the sin nature. Jesus didn't have the sin nature, folks. Listen, the devil can't tempt you with what you don't desire. I have never been once tempted to steal a camel. Not once. But I get tempted to waste too much time watching TV and movies and not reading my scripture sometimes. Hello, somebody. I don't think I'm the only one either. Be honest. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with you, God. Listen, if you have taken care of your lust for sex, if you have taken care of uh your lust for for all sorts of inordinate things alcohol you can say alcohol drugs we can go down the list if you've taken care of that lust and you have crucified that lust then the devil has nothing to tempt you with if you don't have a uh, lust to go drinking satan can't tempt you with alcohol now in order to resist satan for uh, folks we need to first Submit to God, Romans 6, 13. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. 
Submitting to God, folks, as his soldier is described as putting on armor. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles. Look at that word, wiles. Reminds me of the old Roadrunner cartoons. Wiley Coyote, always coming up with schemes to get that Roadrunner. Now, uh, just, just let me go ahead and ruin your childhood like mine was ruined. Uh, sharing is caring. Coyotes actually run twice as fast as Roadrunners. Now, let's pretend that we didn't know that, and I didn't just ruin all your entire childhood and make you cry like a four-year-old girl, and look at the illustration. That coyote was always coming up with new and different ways to trap and devour that Roadrunner, and Satan wants to do the same thing to you that that coyote was trying to do to that Roadrunner, trap him and devour him. Hello, somebody! And the purpose of that armor is to be able to stand against that old devil in his wiles. We must always keep our guard up, folks, because that devil will use your own fleshly desires. Hello? I'm telling you right now, the Bible tells you right there. We, we just talked about it, but let's look at it again. He will use your fleshly desires to manipulate you to sin against the Lord your God. 1 Peter 5 8, be sober, be vigilant. Those are commands. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Just like that old wily coyote wanted to devour that roadrunner, that devil wants to devour you. It is when your guard is down, folks, that the devil has the most power to tempt you. So we need to guard our hearts. Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We need to guard our hearts. folks. <laughs> okay, in, in your heart, that's your inner man right there. It's talking about your inner man. What do you have inside your inner man? You have your spirit, which has been resurrected by the Holy Ghost. Again, look at Ephesians 2. It's awesome. Okay, you have been spiritually resurrected. You were dead in sin, and now you are quickened, made alive. But also in there is your soul. Now, your soul, your soul is, is your control mechanism. All right, and that soul folks, needs to be guarded. We need to guard our hearts. Now, Ephesians 4.27 says, neither give place to the devil. Satan will get a hold of your lust if you let him, folks. He will use your lust to draw you away and manipulate you. And folks, if we're talking about uh, not, not, um, <laughs> not making provision for the flesh, one of the things, if you have a problem with alcohol, don't keep a case of beer in your fridge. Hello, somebody. Look, folks, Satan will lie to you. Acts 5 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath the Satan, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? This was an evil act. People lied to the Holy Spirit. But look at this. Satan makes evil look good. 2 Corinthians 11, 14, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Come on, Eve. God didn't really say that, did he? He's holding this back from you. Come on, Eve. You know you want the tree. Come on. You know you're looking at it. You know you like it. You like the way it looks. Come on. You know this is good stuff. God just doesn't want you to have that good thing. Come on, Eve. Oh, Satan manipulating Eve. Satan manipulating us. I'm telling you that right now. But here's the thing, folks. Here's the thing. Okay? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Folks, you have the power because of the Holy Spirit. And we cannot allow Satan to get a foothold, folks. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, but we are not ignorant of his devices. Folks, a foothold can become a stronghold. We need to be very careful that we understand what the devil is doing. We understand his wiles. We understand his motives. We cannot be ignorant of his devices. All right. And if you are a Christian and you are a Bible believer and you study for any length of time, you are not taken in by the devil's wiles. You understand what he is doing. And again, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Folks, faith gives us the power to repel the devil's attacks. Ephesians 6, 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Arrows of fire, folks, were often shot at enemy troops. 
And if they could get into one of those crevices in the armor, you had a fire on the inside. But that shield would be lifted up, and if the 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 shield wouldn't catch on fire. So if the shield was lifted up, okay, it'd get hot underneath there because because of what the shield's made of, but it would not engulf the shield in fire and it would protect the soldier. Now these arrows of fire, folks, fiery darts, the word dart uh, also used to mean arrow. They were synonymous until they changed the meaning of the word uh, dart. Uh, now, now it's like you, you say you play darts. You, you, it's completely different from shooting a bow and arrow. Now it's just throwing it like. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, the, the the thing is though, when I think fiery darts or even fiery arrows, folks, sometimes I feel like I get global thermonuclear bombs dropped on my head. But listen, faith is our defense against the devil's attacks, against the devil's volleys. We must exercise that faith continually. And this is point number seven. We must understand there are others watching. Hebrews 12, 1 says this. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I always feel like somebody's watching me. You think you have the right to privacy, folks, not in the kingdom of God. You may think you're uh, in a closet, but you're really sitting in a full arena. How does knowing, folks, how does knowing that someone is watching you influence your behavior? Think about it. Well, we are often numb to the fact that God sees everything. But it isn't just God that sees. You have a great cloud of witnesses watching. And when God's kingdom is established at his judgment, for nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Luke 8, 17. There is no privacy in the kingdom of God. And we need to keep that in mind for when we are faced with temptation. So somebody's watching at all times. Point number eight. We must make no provision for the flesh. Romans 13, 14 says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. No provision. We are to make no provision to allow ourselves to be tempted to the point where we are going to sin. Your spirit, folks, is in Christ. But, <laughs> buddy, your flesh is still cursed with that sin nature and is still very much a part of this world. And you need to shun what that flesh wants. First John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. First Timothy 6.10 and 11 says to run from the love of money. Run away from it. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. This kind of looks like an anti-prosperity message, doesn't it? It's what it looks like to me, too. We are to run from the love of money. We're also to run away from youthful lusts, 1 Timothy 2.12, or 1 Timothy 2.22, rather. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. When the spirit of lust hits you, get away from wherever you are. Go somewhere it can't entice you. Make no provision. Also, we are to run away from all forms of ungodly sex. 618 flee fornication every sin that a man doeth is without the body but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body run we're to run away from idolatry first corinthians 10 14 wherefore my dearly beloved flee from idolatry run get away from it anything that 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 gets in the way between you and your god is idolatry 
Relationships can be idolatry. Spending more time watching movies and TV than you spend with God is idolatry. Run from it. Point 10. We must take every thought captive. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 and 5, or 3 through 5, rather. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Guys, your thoughts matter. Proverbs 24, 9 says, the thought of foolishness is sin. This is where temptation originates, guys, our thoughts. Matthew 9, 4 says, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Hello, somebody. Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts, in your inner man? Guys, thoughts come from your inner man. They come from your heart. Matthew 5, 13, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Job 31, 1 says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Proverbs 16, 3, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. Commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. If you keep a steadfast commitment that everything you do will be in service to God, the devil will get the point that he can't mess with you. He cannot use your thoughts to manipulate you to sin. Your mind will then be purified. Point number 11, we must take every desire captive as well. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of this earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We are to turn our affections from this world to the things of God. We are tempted, folks, when our affections are still set on this earth. James 1.14 says, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Folks, these lusts come from our mortal bodies. Romans 6.12 Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. The lust thereof, the lust of what? The lust of your mortal body. We cannot allow ourselves to love this present evil world. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Folks, we are to long. We are to desire. We are to thirst after the commandments of God. Psalm 119.40, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. And we are to delight in his comforts. Psalm 94.19, In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. We are to hate vain thoughts, folks, and love God's law. Psalm 119.113, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. We are to love his commandments. We are to love his word. We are to hate every false way. Yes, the Christian has a hate life. Psalm 119, 104, through thy precepts, that means through thy commandments, I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. And then we have Psalm 119, 128, therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Folks, we are to hate evil. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Guys, again, the fear of the Lord, the reverence of God. If you don't hate evil, you do not reverence God. We are to hate evil. Why? Because our desires are set on our rewards in God's heavenly kingdom. That's where they belong, not on this earth, not in this world. Point number 12, we need to continue in the word of God. John 8, 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Colossians 3, 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Proverbs 37, 31, 
says the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Why won't his steps slide? Because the law of God is in his heart. And we have Psalm 119.11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus, folks, demonstrated this principle in his own temptation. Why did Jesus keep saying when the devil offered his, his hungry body food, when the, when the devil tried to stroke his ego by having him cast himself down to be caught by angels, when the devil offered him all the kingdoms of the world without him having to go to the cross, even when the devil used out-of-context scriptures, Jesus responded with, It is written. As a matter of fact, Matthew 4.4 4, says it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god and i want to end with psalm 1 verses 1 through 3 blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful 